speak on a subject about is Jesus Christ really God? A lot of people believe he was a good man, a prophet, might even be king. But is he God? A lot of people teach about Jesus Christ coming into the world. Some even teach that he was a God, but not the God. Is Jesus Christ God? So in the book of Philippians, in chapter 2, I want you to look there with me, in verse 5, where it says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not Robert to be equal with God. Do you realize what that verse says? Jesus Christ didn't think that he was robbing anything by claiming to be equal with God. That's the same as saying he's God. And he is, I believe. But made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men, been found in fashion as a man. He humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him. Hmm. Now, wait a minute. How many gods are there? And have given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in the earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is, is what? Lord. To the glory of God the Father. It's very easy to get a little confused. I'm not sure I can straighten it all out. But I want to talk to you a little bit about something I believe is very, very important. You see, is Jesus Christ really God? In the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 6 and verse 4, it makes this statement, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Although God is one, is also Trinity. That doesn't mean there's three gods. There's only one God. This word is very important. Elohim means two or more to be three or more. But I am makes it plural. You see the very same thing in the words cherubim and also seraphim. Where it can mean more than one. It'll use the word cherubim as singular and then they. When you study this one verse in particular, it means two or more, therefore signifying the omnipotent trinity. And we believe in the trinity. I often will get things from different people that tell me that Jesus is not Jehovah. He's not God. And therefore, we're worshiping incorrectly. This was about two weeks ago. It's one of the reasons I thought I'm going to cover that. Jehovah means self existing one and applies only to the Most High God. He is translated capital L O R D. I remember whenever I took Bible doctrine under Dr. Mark Cameron, he has a whole page, a chapter on this about theology and understanding the names of God and Jehovah Nissi and the Jehovah Jireh. So forth, and the Lord will provide, and he that healeth, and all these various things. The Lord tisketh our, our righteousness. All these are interesting things, and they're tied up into that name of Jehovah himself. Now, Adonai, translated Lord, and it means he is in authority. And it can apply to a, a person, or a king, or even to God. So there's these three main words that you'll find them scattered throughout the scriptures. King James helps you to understand which one by how it is spelled or whether a capital or not. So this is why I love the King James Version because it explains some of these things and helps you to understand a little bit better. This means that Jehovah, our Elohim, more than one, is Echad, means one. He is one Jehovah. There's not two Jehovahs, three Jehovahs, there's only one Jehovah, but he's revealed in three persons. He said, do you really understand all of that? No. But I believe it. For it's taught in the Bible. 
And therefore, I want to show you a few things I think will help in our understanding. Now, Jehovah, our God, is the only living and true God. He only is God. And He is but one God. So we worship the true and living God. He is Jehovah, a self-existent being, eternal and immutable. His eternal omnipotence, omnipresence, infinity, goodness, self-sufficiency, and perfection is evidence. There can be no second. There can be no equal. He is God. And therefore, when you study the scriptures, you'll come to the conclusion there's only one true and living God. There can be but one eternal, one omnipotent, one omnipresent, one infinite. One that is originally and of himself good and all-sufficient and perfect being. There can't be another. There cannot be a God that must depend upon another God. God is God. And we talk about, we believe in God. But there's not just about believing in God, but believing who is God. And believe in what did God say, believe in what did God do. Remember last week we talked about two main things. Human reasoning and divine wisdom. The divine perspective and a human perspective. So as you look at life, you can either look at life through the eyes of Scripture or lay it aside and look at it through the eyes of man. And you'll find out that man does not always agree with what the Bible says. That's why he says, Cursed is the man who putteth his confidence or his trust in man. Therefore, we're to trust what God's word has to say. It must be concluded from his being God, he is the first cause of all things, which can be but one, and from his relationship to his creatures, as their king, ruler, governor, lawgiver, and I could include Savior. And for this purpose, these words are cited in the book of Mark, in chapter 12 and verse 29. They had come to Jesus and asked him, what is the greatest law? And so he tells them what the greatest law is. And he tells them, he says, to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, body, soul, and strength, and then love thy neighbor as thyself, which was the second law. The scribe says, you know, you have answered correctly. He got an A on his test. Isn't that wonderful? Give God a test. Do you know the answer to this question? But it says this. And Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, is one Lord. Jehovah is one. He's one. And Elohim, two or more, is one. Jesus knew that. This is what he was quoting from the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 6 and verse 4. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. Deuteronomy 4.35 says this. To thee it was shown that thou might have known that the Lord, all caps, means Jehovah. He is God, Elohim. There is none beside him. Now, when you study the book of Isaiah, you'll find from about 43 chapter, 43 chapter on, about 48, a lot of times you talk about, I am the Lord. I am the Savior. There is none other. My glory will I not give to another. I created all things. Even I am Jehovah. I, all the way through. And so there is no other one that can claim that he is God. There is only one God. He said, well, how can you explain all this? Well, he says in verse 39, Know therefore this day and consider it in thine heart that the Lord, he is God. In heaven above and upon the earth beneath, there is none else. No one beside him. Only one true and living God. In 2 Kings chapter 5 and verse 15, he says this. This is concerning the Saul when he was going to be made the king of Israel. He returned to the man of God, he and all his company, and came and stood before him. And he said, Behold, 
now I know that there is no God in all the earth, but in Israel. Now, therefore, I pray thee, take a blessing from thy servant. Now, there's only one true and living God. And God is the God of Israel. Now, today, we hear an awful lot about the nations of the world turning against Israel. But the Lord had made a promise in the book of Genesis in chapter 12. I will bless them that bless thee, and I will curse them that curse thee. America better stand behind Israel. This is why I did not like what I saw in the last eight years. And if there's anybody here that doesn't like my position on this, I'm sorry, but no, I'm not sorry. I believe it's the scriptural position to be and to have. He says in Psalms 86 and verse 10, For thou art great and doeth wondrous things. Thou art God alone. In other words, the scriptures keep telling us that there's only one true and living God. And there can't be another that it's his equal. But sometimes it looks like there's a contradiction in the Bible. Galatians 3.20 says, Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. One God and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. There's only one God, the one Father of all. This is what the book says, says. And that's even in the New Testament. The Bible also says there are three persons. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, who are distinct from each other and yet are united in perfect union. <clears throat> now, if I had the ability, and I don't, I have three chairs I could sit up here, and I put my body in one, my soul in one, and my spirit in the other, then you could see all three of us. But I'm only one person. But I could be revealed three different ways. My body that I live in is what makes me world conscious. I can see it. I can hear it. I can smell it. I can taste. I can feel. It is my soul that makes me self-conscious. I know that I'm real. I know that I'm here. i got to be more than my body because when I die, my body's still there. It's dead without me. It needs me in order to live. So I am a soul. And I have a spirit, and God wants my spirit is what makes me God conscious. So I am world conscious, I am self conscious, and I am God conscious. But I'm only one person. God wants my body to be healthy, He wants my soul to be happy, and He wants my spirit to be holy. So this is why we have indwelling us when we trust Christ as our Savior, the Holy Spirit. Who created the world? Now the world is here. <clears throat> Somebody made it. Did you do it? I didn't do it. But it's here. It's either that it created itself or somebody made it. I happen to believe that it makes more sense that somebody made it. And there is someone who claims to have done so. <clears throat> so we ought to be able to at least listen to his testimony. That's why he says that uh, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So God says that he did it. Now, can you disprove that? <clears throat> can you prove God did not create the heavens and the earth? Have fun. There were some um, archaeologists that uh, wanted to have a little test. They said, well, we can take and make man from the dust of the earth, too. So they're going to have a showdown with God. So here's God, and he's going to make a man out of the dirt. And they say they can make a man out of the dirt. So they got some dirt, and God says, ah, go get your own dirt. Uh, they can't even make dirt, let alone make a man. Hebrews 11 and verse 3 says, Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. In other words, there's something that's beyond the visibility of man, that you cannot see with the naked eye. So we are made out of things that you can't see. But God says he framed the worlds by the word of God. The word of God. The word of God. He spoke and the world came into existence. And we're supposed to believe that. Since I can't disprove it, I'm going to believe it until I can't prove it. Or can prove that it's not true. So, who created the world? 
God the Father says he did it. Now, who created the world? Well, God the Son says he did it. You see, in John chapter 1 and verse 1, he says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Now, wait a minute. There's only one true and living God. And the Bible says there's none that's his equal. It says there's only one. But it describes him as three and one. Three distinct persons and one God. Now, we can't maybe understand that, but we'll do the best we can from what the Scriptures teach us. He says in verse 2, The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Well, remember, the Bible just said while ago in the book of Genesis in chapter 1, in the beginning God created the earth. God did that. And here he's saying, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. He did it. Well, this is talking about the Son. So the Son made the world. Now, is that the only scripture? <clears throat> Look in Colossians chapter 1, verse 16 here in your note. For by him were all things created. You see, the verse right before this talks about Jesus Christ. And about the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. We have been translated into the kingdom of his dear Son. Whom made all things. That are in heaven. That are upon the earth. Visible, invisible, thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers, all things were created by him and for him. So who made all things? Well, the Bible says the Son did. So if the Son did it, why did he do it? Well, it says it was made for him. See, it was made by him, for him. So why were you created for him? He's the one who created you. Do you realize that for all these centuries, you weren't here? Now you are. Who put you here at this time? God said he did it. You see, God has a timetable too. God's already told us what's going to take place in the future. Do you think he knows everything about you? When you were to begin? And your day of appointment? When you leave? Now you can hurry it up if you want. Many people do. Have you ever heard of people who die before their time? Well, when was your time? The Bible says, children, obey your parents and the Lord. For this is right. And uh, th that your days may be long upon the earth. That your days may be long. You know, maybe you can live longer if you did right. Maybe you can shorten your life if you do wrong. I'm just saying, God said it. And so he says, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before, get to he, the son, Jesus, is before all things. And by him all things consist. He made everything that's makeable. He did it. Says he did. Now, is there a contradiction in the Bible or is Jesus God? Is Jesus God? If he's just a man... How could he have been here from the very beginning in the beginning with God? And then everything was made by him. A man did that? I don't think so. Who created the world? Well, the Bible says the Holy Spirit. You see, in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2, it said, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. The Spirit of God. So we know the Father said He did it. And now we know Jesus said He did it. But the Holy Spirit was there and He said He did it. In verse 104, chapter 104, verse 30 of the book of Psalms. Thou sendest forth thy Spirit. They are created. And thou renewest the face of the earth. And God says that He had a part in that. The Holy Spirit did it. So, which one of them did it? Well, maybe all three of them did it. But there's only one God. 
But he reveals himself in three persons. Now, I don't have the ability to do this because my body, see, was not my spirit. My spirit's not my soul. My soul is not my body. But we're all human. I have a human body and a human soul and a human spirit. There is God the Father. Now, we sometimes use illustrations like, okay, here I am. I am a son to my mother. I am a husband to my wife. But I'm a father to my children. Now, how many of me are there? I'm only one. But I'm different to each one of them. But I'm only one. They shouldn't take water, H2O. Comes in solid liquids and gases. But it's still H2O. But when it's a vapor, it's not ice. But each one's different and unique. But it's all H2O. I don't know if there's a perfect illustration concerning the Godhead. I really don't care. But when I read the scriptures, I know that God, the Father, is the Father. And I know that God, the Son, is the Son. And I know that God, the Holy Spirit, is the Holy Spirit. And I believe there's only one God. Who raised up Jesus from the dead? Who raised him from the dead? Well, of course we know. It was God, the Father, raised him from the dead. You see, in Romans, in chapter 6 and verse 4, it says, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. You see, his death on the cross for us was substitution. He was in my place. See, I have sinned, Against the holy God. But God as the father. Can't die. So he God took upon flesh. And lived in a physical body. And the Bible says that he was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. Because angels don't die. But the wages of sin is death. So the only way he can die for me. He must become like me. So in the likeness of sinful flesh. He was born into this world. And that's why he says in Hebrews in chapter 10, he said, a body has thou prepared me. <coughs> so he was prepared. He came into the world and he took our sins upon him and he died and paid for it, came back from the dead. So the Bible says that he was raised by the glory of the Father. Okay. Is there more to this? Than what meets the eye? Do we really think, humanly speaking, we can understand all the things that are revealed to us by God? We got a lot to listen to and a lot to learn. This is what he says in the book of 1 Thessalonians in chapter 1, verse 10. He said, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he, God, had raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivered us from the wrath to come. Now, how did Jesus, dying on the cross, deliver us from the wrath to come? Well, why did Jesus die? To pay for our sins. Why? Because we were under the sentence of death. We were going to be separated from God. And this is why he said, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abideth upon him. In the book of John chapter 3 verse 36. So the wrath of God abides upon every person born into this world. And we're all going to die. So Christ goes to the cross. And God poured out his wrath upon his son. So that he in a physical body could die. He could be separated from the body. This is something that had never been done before, never experienced before. And the Bible says, and he learned obedience by the things that he suffered. He had never done that. Before. God had never suffered before. So Jesus comes into the world and takes upon himself a physical body. And in the likeness of sinful flesh, it didn't have sinful flesh, but in the likeness of it, a human body, Jesus Christ died in our place. And God poured his wrath upon his son. So his son died. And he died and paid for our sins while he was on the cross. Not when he was in the grave. 
And not when he was buried. He paid for our sins on the cross. That's where he died. That's where the payment was made. Now, when Jesus paid for the sins of the world, he did it for every person in the world and comes back from the dead. And he says, he that believeth will have life. He that believeth not, the wrath of God abideth upon them. So those who trust Christ as their Savior, see the great advantage? You have been delivered from the wrath that is to come. That's why he says, and to wait for his Son, Jesus Christ, from heaven, who's coming back. And the reason we wait for him coming from heaven is because he rose from the dead, ascended into heaven, and that's where he is. So he's going to come back from heaven, who delivered us from the wrath to come. Now, you may be here today, and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior. That means you have not yet been delivered from the wrath that is to come. Because the payment he made is not put to your account until you believe. He did that for you. When you accept his payment for your sins, then you won't have, you won't have any sins to pay for. He died in your place as your substitute. That's why I can say, I know I'm going to heaven whenever I die. Because, see, I've already paid for all of my sins through Christ. He did it for me. He was my substitute. He paid in my place. Do you all really get this? Do you really understand what I'm saying? If you do, raise your hand. Let me see your hands. You really get it. All right, put your hand down. You say, I don't understand the word you say. Well, raise your hand. No, no, no. <laughs> Just warn, that's all. Now get this. Who raised up Jesus from the dead? Oh, God the Father. Hebrews 13, 20 makes this statement. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant. I remember at the end of most of our classes, Dr. Mark Cameron will always quote and sing when he quote those verses. Uh, Bob, do you remember that? He would quote these verses at the end of his class in his prayer. And he would always say, the guy was a walking Bible. It was just plain awesome. Now, get this. In Acts 13, 29, it makes a statement. And when they had fulfilled all that was written concerning him, they took him down from the tree, laid him in a sacrifice. And look at verse 30. He says, but... God raised him from the dead. Now, when we go to the next slide, you'll understand God raised him from the dead. It was God that did it. So how can Jesus say he did it? Unless the Bible contradicts itself. Or maybe Jesus is God. I don't want you to ever have a doubt Acts chapter 17, verse 31 says, Because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. Because everything God does must be right. He is the righteous judge. He makes no mistakes. He is perfect. And he's going to judge the world. But he hath committed all judgment unto the Son, as he says in the book of John chapter 6. But he says, By that man, who's he going to judge the world by in righteousness? By that man whom he hath ordained, of which he hath given assurance to all men, and that he hath what? Raised him from the dead. God says he raised him from the dead. And that everyone, if you trust Christ now, he will not be your judge, he will, he's your Savior. But those who reject Jesus Christ as their Savior, the Bible says there's a day coming because God has ordained that man whom he raised from the dead to be the judge. Is it important or does it matter? I think all of this is important. And this and what we're talking about is the real world. And I want to live in the real world. And you believe the truth and live the truth. That's what's real. When you let the devil lie to you and deceive you then you're living in an unreal world. You don't really see yourself. You don't see the world. You don't see life. You don't see anything the way that it really is. 
And you will not see the consequences down the road the way it's going to really be. Well, when I die, I just go six feet under and that's it. Is it possible the man is not seeing correctly? I asked a man one time, I says, where are you going to die? He says, six feet under. And that's as far as I'm going. I said, have you ever died before? He says, no. I said, then how do you know that's true? That's what you would like to believe. But you're living in a false world. That's not reality. Think of how many people in this world are not in reality. They don't, they've don't. they been deceived. The Bible says the devil has deceived the whole world. Who raised up Jesus from the dead? Well, God the Son says he did. You see, in John chapter 2, verse 19, he was talking to his disciples. It already done been and committed that, uh, you know, making the water into wine at the first wedding there in chapter 2. And then it says this. Jesus answered and said to them, destroy this temple. In three days, I, I will raise it up. Destroy this temple. In three days, I'll raise it up. The Jews thought he was talking about the temple that was there that took 46 years to build. Then said the Jews, 40 and 6 years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in 3 days? Now think. Do you think they really understood what temple he was talking about? He wasn't talking about that temple, but he's going to, because in the book of Acts chapter 17, he says, I will rebuild the tabernacle of Israel. He's going to do it. When he comes back in power and great glory. Now, in verse 21 he says, But he spoke of the temple of his body. When therefore he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them. And they believed the scriptures and the word which was that Jesus had spoken. And he says, Destroy this temple, that body of his, in three days I'll raise it again. He said he's going to do it. Do you know of another man that can cause himself to come back from the dead? You got any loved ones? Have they been able to come back from the dead? If you were to die today, can you come back from the dead? But Jesus came back from the dead, and he can rise, raise the dead. And he says, if you destroy this body, I'm going to come back from the dead in three days. Did he do what he said he was going to do? He did it. No. He also makes a statement. In John 10, verse 17, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I, I, lay down my life, that I may take it again. Well, wait a minute, I thought it was the God who smit his own son. If you read the book of Isaiah, in chapter 53, he was smitten of God. Here he said, I did it. Then in John 10, in verse 38, uh, 18, he says, No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. He said, I could have called 10,000 angels. Jesus wasn't worried. But he says, I have power to lay it down and get the last part. And I have power to take it again. I can lay it down and I can bring it back to life. Now, the only one that should be able to do this is God. Because God says he did it. God the Father says he did it. But the Son says he did it. Interesting. Who raised up Jesus from the dead? Well, God the Holy Spirit. You see, even concerning the body of Jesus, in the book of uh, Peter in chapter 3, verse 18, where he talks about that Jesus became our substitute and died in our place, but he was quickened by the Spirit. Quickened by the, made alive by the, raised from the dead by the Spirit. That was concerning Jesus. But the Bible also tells us in the book of Romans in chapter 8 that the Holy Spirit who lives within us is going to quicken our mortal bodies and cause us to rise again and to change us when the Lord comes back in power and great glory and we'll be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. But if the Spirit of Jesus from the dead dwelleth raised up from the dead, He is going to live within us and quicken our mortal bodies as He says. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. But God commendeth his love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, who died for us? Christ died for us. 
He died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood. Because the question now is, who justifies man? Who justifies man? You see, we're all sinners. And to go to heaven, we have to be <coughs> in righteousness, in perfection, and holy. We've got to be equal with God. And man on his own can't do that. God must not be able to find any fault in us. Uh, no man with any sin can enter into the place of the holy city. No sin can enter in. So therefore we have to be as perfect, as righteous. But we're not. So somebody has to justify us, clear us of all the charges that are against us. You ever hear about, well, no, God keeps the book. Well, he's keeping the books all right. And there may be a whole bunch of things that are against you. So the Bible says that God took those things that were against us and nailed it to his cross. And he, Christ, paid for all of your offenses. All of your sins, your transgressions, your iniquity, everything. He paid for all sin. And he says that when you believe that, he did it for you, you're justified. Just as righteous as if you had never sinned. Like it never happened. God can do that. But who's the one who justifies you? God commended his love toward us. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for me. Much more than being now justified by his blood. I'm justified, made righteous, declared just in God's eyes by his payment for my sins. And all I had to do was believe that he did it for me. He said, being justified freely by his grace. You see, we don't earn eternal life. You see, if you had to earn your way to heaven, and then when you get to heaven, God looks at all your works and says, you get to go in because you're justified. All your good works pay for all of your bad works, and so you're clear, you get to go. But he's already said, not by works of righteousness which we have done. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not of works. So no man can ever be justified by his works. Therefore, by the law is the knowledge of sin. And no man can save himself by his good deeds. This is why, do you have to go to church to go to heaven? If you did, then you would be justified. Do you give money to go to heaven? No. Because that means you could justify. You can't justify yourself. Therefore, no man, no flesh can be justified by the law. For by the law is the light in which we can see how we can be justified by faith. And not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. No man has ever been justified by his works. Nobody. And you can't today, this is why the only hope any person can ever have, you must accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. We're talking about accepting Jesus Christ. We're talking about the one who came into the world and died on that cross and paid for your sins. And the only reason you can do that is because he was God in the flesh. God in the flesh. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word, in verse 14 says, became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father. Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. Now, get this in mind. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. If you believe on Christ, he gives you his righteousness. That would make you as righteous as God. You go to heaven on what he did, not on what you do. I'm not going to heaven because I'm good. I'm going to heaven because he is. Not because of my righteousness. For 56 and a half years I've been going to church. Three to four to five to six times a week. For all those years. I've given a lot of money to missions and the church. And I've tried to live a good, clean, honorable life. And blah, 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 blah. The only reason I'm going to heaven is because when I was 18, in a little old living room, I trusted Christ as my Savior. That's why I'm going to heaven. And everything since then doesn't add to it, doesn't secure it, doesn't make it more real, doesn't make it better. I was just as secure that day I trusted the Lord as I am today. Because all I did was trust Christ as my Savior. He saved me then, and I'm still saved. Nothing has changed. So if I maybe have grown and matured a little bit, got over. Who is the one who justifies man? Well, 
in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 11 says this, And such were some of you, but you're washed, but you're sanctified, but you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In his name. When they asked Jesus, I mean the disciples, uh, in whose name are you doing this? He says, in the name of Jesus Christ. In other words, in his honor, for his glory, because of the power that's in that name. And that's why when we trust Christ as our Savior, Jesus Christ is not a first and last name like Ralph Arnold. Jesus is Jehovah. Christ is the Messiah, the anointed one. God in the flesh. Remember when Jesus was going to be born, it says his name shall be called Jesus, for he shall save his people from his sins. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. That was Jesus. His name would be called Emmanuel, which is an untranslated Hebrew word, which means God with us. That's who he is. Who is the one that justifies him? Well, God the Holy Spirit. He says, see, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 11, it says, And such were some of you. The same verse. By the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is God. The Holy Spirit of our God. How many is there? Oh, there's only one God. Oh, we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. See, you and I do not get our righteousness by putting our faith in our good works, by putting our faith in the church, by putting our faith in a man or a preacher or a priest or anybody else. You see, we get it because we joyfully anticipate the word hope. Our confidence is in what Christ did for us. And so we now, as his children, are waiting for the day when these bodies of ours are going to be redeemed. And we're going to be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye and caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Who's the one that justifies man? Well, God the Father. You see, in Exodus 31, back in the Old Testament. See, it says it in the New Testament, but it also says this in the Old Testament. Speak thou also to the children of Israel, saying, Verily, my Sabbath ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you, Throughout your generation, that you may know that I am the L O R D, all kept, I am Jehovah that does sanctify you. You see, we have to be made pure and holy, set apart for the Lord. Now, Israel as a nation was set apart. Individuals, when we trust Christ as our Savior, Hagiazo means to be made pure and holy and set apart. You have been sanctified. Set apart. You're now a child of God. You've been made pure and holy. There's no sins against you. Not because you deserve it, but because God loved you. And he made a payment for your sins. And when you believe that, you are made pure and holy and set apart. But it's Jehovah that does that. It's God the Father. Though we see that the Son does it. And we see that the Holy Spirit does it. But you also see that God the Father also is the one who sanctifies us. Now, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19, he says, To wit, God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them. In other words, not imputing their trespasses to them. See, when Christ died, he imputes our sins to his Son. Not to me. This is why when you read in the book of Romans in chapter 4, where it says this blessing that we have is because our sins are not imputed to us. He said, what did you do wrong yesterday? It's imputed to the Son. It's put to His account. He paid for it. He paid for all the sins of the world. There's no one who deserves to go to heaven. This is why God says, by grace are you saved through faith. Grace. If a man trusts Christ as Savior, and God saves him, gives him eternal life, and never cast him out, never lose him, and if he doesn't do right and serve the Lord for the rest of his life, if he got to heaven, that'd be grace, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? That'd be grace. You're saved by grace. Nobody has deserved to go to heaven. You either get there God's way, or you don't get there at all. In 2 Corinthians 5.21 it says, For he, God, hath made him, Christ, to be sin for us. See, Christ knew no sin. He never did anything wrong. He was made sin for us. 
that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So when you trusted Christ as your Savior, God takes you and places you in his son. So when God looks for you, he finds you in his son. And God sees his son as perfect and righteous and just and holy. So where am I? I'm in his son. You see, when you're not in the son, God sees you with all your sins. But you see, I have been placed in Christ. I did that when I was 18 years old. And he said, he'll never cast me out, never lose me. I can never be lost. I can never go to hell in the future. Having eternal life and going to heaven is the best news I ever heard in my whole life. Now we have the Father, we have the Son, and we have the Holy Spirit. And according to the Bible, there's only one God. All three is God. John 10, 30 makes this statement. Jesus says, I and the Father are what? Are one. And you know they wanted to pick up stones and stone him because, and he asked him a question, he said, but what good work do you stone me? He said, for no good work, but because of blasphemy. You, being a man, makest thyself God. You're claiming to be God. And they knew what he was claiming to be. He was talking about Abraham. And he was talking to those people who wouldn't believe on him. And he says, Abraham, rejoice to see my day. And they said, what? You're not yet 50 years old. How can you say you saw Abraham? But did he? Yes. He had already talked to Abraham. See, when he talks about the son, he's always been. Always in the beginning, and there's only one God. I can't explain it any better than that. But then I'm not the best teacher in all the world. But I do believe that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. And I have put my trust not in a man, but in the God-man. I believe Jesus Christ was fully human and fully God. He was the perfect God-man. He was a perfect man and a perfect God. You explain it. I don't know how to explain it. But I believe it with all my heart. Look up here. Letting this hand represent you and me. And this wallet represents sin. We all have sin on us. But God says that he loves us. And the wages of sin is death. Since everybody sins, everybody's condemned. And the wrath of God abides upon us all. And so that's why people die. And that's why they'll spend eternity separated from the Lord. But you see, to go to heaven, we have to be perfect as righteous as God. And none of us are perfect. None of us are righteous. We're not good to go. And God says, the whole world is guilty. We're all in the same boat. And we cannot save ourselves. Impossible. There's no amount of good deeds you can do to save yourself. So this is why God, the Father, sent his Son into the world. He took up on a body lived in this world, and lived perfectly, broke no laws, did not sin, did not have to die. So he voluntarily chose to take our place, die for us in our place. So he took all the sins of the world, and he made a payment on the cross. He came back from the dead and said that whosoever would believe in him would not perish. Those who will not believe it, he says, the wrath of God abideth upon him. This is why it makes so much sense to trust Christ as your Savior. There's no tricks to it. There's no gimmicks. That verse that we closed with just a moment ago, 2 Corinthians 5.21, says, For he, God, hath made him, Jesus Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So when you trust Christ as your Savior, God gives you his righteousness. If he gave you his righteousness, that would make you as righteous as who? God. As God. Would that be good enough to go to heaven on? Yes. So we go to heaven on what Christ did for us. You don't earn it. You don't work for it. Let's pray, shall we? With every head bowed and every eye closed and no one looking around. If you have never trusted the Lord, would you trust him right now? I can't explain everything. 
If you read the Bible, you're not going to understand it all either. But there's a few things you can understand. You can understand this. You're a sinner. So am I. God loves you. Loves me too. He died on that cross for both of us. I believed it. I have eternal life. Would you believe it? Would you right now, this moment, would you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior? Would you trust Him to take you to heaven when you die? Friend, God said if you would trust Him, He would save you. If He saves you, He saves you from something. From hell. To something. To an inheritance that's incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away. A place reserved for you in heaven. Don't you want to go there? And you can know it today. In just a moment, I'm going to ask for a raise your hand. Raising your hand doesn't save you. It just lets me know that what I said made sense to you. You're saying, preacher, that made sense to me. And today I will accept Jesus Christ as my Savior. And I want you to pray for me. Friend, I'd love to know. So with heads bowed and eyes closed, no one looking around. Would you just slip your hand up very quickly, put it right back down, and say, yes, I'll trust Christ as my Savior this morning. I want to be certain of going to heaven when I die. Is there anyone at all? Yes, God bless you, sir. Anyone else? Just slip it up very quickly. You may have heard it all your life, but maybe have never made that decision. Yes, I will accept Christ as my Savior. Would you do it right now? I'm not talking about trusting this church, trusting the preacher, trusting the good works. Can you trust the true and living God? Anyone else before we close? Our Father, we thank you so much for all you've done for us. We're thankful for this great truth that you have in your word, that we're not following some cunningly devised fable or some man that's on a high horse claiming to be something he's not. We're so thankful to know that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, that he died on that cross and paid for our sins so that we could have eternal life. Lord, thank you for the individual indicated by an uplifted hand that they would trust you right now. And Father, we ask your blessings upon the services tonight and that you'll continue to bless our country and for those that are making many decisions in the direction so that we can live a quiet and peaceful life. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.